right. I am super excited today because my special guest is Dr. Mary Claire Haper. And I talked to her, I just realized this morning, it was in 2019 last time we talked, but she is here to uh, give us more information about the Galveston diet, which has totally exploded over the past couple of years. Uh, and talk to us a little bit more about menopause weight gain. So Dr. Haber, thank you so much for coming back and talking with me today about this. I'm super excited to have you. Thank you, thank you for having me. So let's talk about the Galveston diet and kind of um, a little bit of the background about why you started this. You know, you're, you're an OBGYN, you're having your customers, or your, sorry, your customers, your patients come in and talk to you about, you know, the issues that they're having with weight gain and the struggles that they're having. And for me personally, I just found out that I'm menopausal. So um, this is super relevant right now. But um, one of the things that I found is like the old methodology of cutting calories and working out more just stopped working for me. I, it wasn't, it wasn't doing it anymore. And I couldn't figure out kind of what was going on. So sort of walk me through how all of that took place. Sure. So we're going to go way back to medical school for me, uh, which was 1994. I was all of 20. I was a baby. I was 26 when I started medical school. <laughs> and, you know, when I think back in that experience and everything that I learned, you know, I definitely learned that women tend to gain weight as they age, but we never really dug into why. Mm -hmm. And we received, at least in, back in 1994 to 98, very little information about nutrition. Yeah. Um, we learned the basics of what is a fat, a carbohydrate, and a protein, and how many calories in each. But as far as like biochemically what's happening in the body, we learned about certain deficiency states like quashiorcor for no protein. I mean, things that were like dramatic medical issues. But how all of, you know, aging and inflammation and, and menopause and hormones and how they all work together as we age, that was kind of nothing that was ever covered. So then after my residency, I, I mean, during my residency, I chose OBGYN, which has been a great career for me. Um, again, nothing more than calories in, calories out, work out more, eat less to help someone with weight loss and almost putting the onus on the patient as to it's your fault because you're not trying hard enough. It's your fault because you're lazy. It's your fault because you, you know, aren't dealing with whatever issues you have in your life. And certainly there are components to that. But mm -hmm. I think what I found in my practice is the vast majority of people who were complaining of weight gain were not lazy or exercising, were actually eating fairly well and not seeing the results that they saw in their 20s and their in early 30s. Mm -hmm. um, what I noticed that in, in perimenopause, which is, you know, we have perfectly functioning hormones, you know, most of us, not all, um, through our reproductive years. And then somewhere around our mid thirties, ovarian function begins to decline. You may not notice anything, but definitely the ovarian function starts kind of sporadically going up and down. And that may present as erratic periods, hot flashes, mood swings, brain fog, you're forgetting stuff all the time, increased arthritis, increased mental health disorders. And it just goes on and on and on. And it just gets worse. And then peaks as your period stops menopause and then tapers in the next five to six years. Mm -hmm. We have this maelstrom of hormonal craziness happening a big chunk of our lives when we're trying to build careers, be moms, raise teenagers, stay married, you know, like all of the things are get unmarried so you can figure out the rest of your life. And no one was really talking about it. And so I, this consistent complaint that I saw with the majority of my patients was I'm gaining weight and I can't understand why. I've done nothing different. I've been healthy, yep. I've been exercising. You know, the things, the tricks I would do to lose the five or 10 pounds for a vacation are just not working anymore. And then it would just compile every year, worse, worse, worse. So over that 10 year perimenopausal period, I might have a patient come in who gained 20, 30 pounds and she's in a new wardrobe. I mean, she is miserable. Her life has changed. And it's affecting her psyche, her marriage, her, her body self-image, all of it. And so here's the saddest part of all this. I would listen and say, pat them on the, you know, very paternalistically pat them on the knee and say, yeah, it's getting older. It's menopause, you know, work out more, eat less was my answer. <laughs> and then, and it's embarrassing because I believed them, but I didn't have any tools to help them work out more, eat less. Then it happened to me. And then I got mad. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't know what you didn't know, right? <laughs> I didn't know what I didn't know. So two yeah. things happened to me at the same time. 
my brother died. Um, he had been ill for a while, <laughs> HIV and hepatitis. And um, I thought I had more time. And he kind of went down very quickly, very suddenly and died abruptly. You know, and I didn't get the closure, the emotional closure, the, the goodbyes, the I'm sorry, the, you know, um, and I was menopausal, like starting to really hit all the menopausal changes at the same time. Mm -hmm. So in my grief, I, you know, nutrition went out the window. I was just trying to survive. I was, you know, numbing myself with too much alcohol in the evenings and processed carbohydrates by the bucket. Mm -hmm. I was diving into those giant boxes of goldfish crackers that I <laughs> kid and um so as the grief started lifting i realized okay i'm not fitting in my clothes <laughs> um, scrubs are very forgiving which is what i wore to work mostly and yeah. um so i kind of got away with it but you know i'd look in the mirror and be like that role wasn't here before what is going on here i need to go back and get healthy again okay i can't say i'm depressed anymore it's time to get my life back Mm -hmm. so I did all the things I told my patients. I was hitting the gym regularly. I was calorie counting like a boss and I had my little app. I was doing points. I was doing all the things and a pound or two would come off and then stop. Mm -hmm. Then I get frustrated and gain a few more back. And I was in this horrible seesaw. So what was happening was as I'd calorie starve myself, I was losing muscle mm -hmm. exercising. I wasn't getting enough protein. And then you know, the scale would say, yeah, you, and then I'd celebrate with, you know, more goldfish and mm -hmm. then I gained fat back. So over, you know, this frustrating process, I was yo-yoing, but losing muscle consistently and just mm -hmm. gaining fat. So yeah. then it got harder and harder and harder. And I realized I was in this negative feedback cycle. And I just heard the voices of my patients complaining of the same things I was going through. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, okay. I'm not doing something right. The workout more, workout, you know, workout more, eat less mantra is not working. And mm -hmm. I, I, ne I need to do something. And my husband was like, you're smart. You're a doctor. Figure this out. Like, stop making <laughs> it. Was, it was, I was obsessed. I was getting up in the middle of the night to weigh myself when I pee. You mm -hmm. know, like, that's not healthy. So no. um, I said, okay. So I started hitting the books. I talked to my friends who are PhD nutritionists. I talked to registered dietitians. I was like getting as much information as I could. I really did a deep drill into the ob -GYN literature. Almost nothing was there as far as, you know, menopause, weight gain, inflammation. But then I kept seeing this theme, inflammation, 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 went down rabbit hole after research rabbit hole and started like formulating this plan in my head. Mm -hmm. So that's how it was born. It was completely selfish. I wasn't trying to save the world. I just wanted to fix me. And, <laughs> I love it. And it worked. <laughs> and so then my girlfriends, my patients are like, and I live in a small town. So I, you know, I see everybody at the grocery store at church, at, you know, at the dinner or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, they're like, you look great. You look great. What are you doing? What are you doing? Cause you know, I was glowing. I was sleeping better. Everything was better. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I want your plan. I was like, I don't do this little plan. I just made it up. So I had to go to the office depot two blocks from here and make copies of my little plan. And I just started. <laughs> I love that. Driving down the stairs, working from home. <laughs> and uh, so um, I kind of stumbled on this. So then I took it to social media. I, I had a Facebook group that followed me. I had a little MLM business doing skincare. And um, so that was a lot of fun. It was a creative, really a creative outlet for me mm -hmm. and it talked a lot about business so so mm -hmm. glad I did that, but I've moved on from that and yeah. I um started talking to my followers about it and they were like me 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 so it gave me the idea to run Facebook groups with the program mm -hmm. and private Facebook groups it was absolutely free and walk them through the program so it taught me how to teach it I got feedback this is working. This isn't working. I need more information on this, less on that. I re it really helped me. So over a year and a half, I gave it away. I wish I could say I had this Machiavellian plan to build this empire. No. <laughs> didn't work that way. It rarely worked that way. <laughs> it was a passion project. I was yes. doing it for fun. I love and it. And then after 1500 women, you know, I had a few savvy entrepreneurs in these groups who were like, Hey, Hey, you need to make this a business. And I'm like, no, I'm a doctor. Ugh, I cannot. They're like, you need to make this business mm -hmm. take it from you. And so I bought the website rights. I got copyrighted. I, you know, trademarked. I did all the things. And then I took a huge leap of faith and launched it as a business in August mm -hmm. of 2018. 
That is amazing. And the growth since then has just been phenomenal. And there's so many things I love learning about people's entrepreneurial journeys. That's like one of the things I'm super passionate about. And a, a few key things that you did that really just kind of stood out to me. Number one is that you gave it away for free because who better to be, you know, your proving ground for this than the people that you know in your real life that can give you that real world feedback. Um, I, a lot of people don't know this, but I started my business in 2012 and I didn't make any money at all until 2014 because for those two years, I was just putting out information, resources and gathering back data that, you know, is what really led to Alpha for me with being what it is today. And also, I love that you did the Facebook group because I feel like that's the place where the support is happening, where we can bounce the ideas off each other, where we can cheer each other on. And just having that community aspect of it is super important, especially when you're on a journey as personal as, you know, weight loss and getting healthy and, and nutrition. So that's super cool. Um, so I want to ask you, what do you think, what, um, what are the key components of the Galveston diet for somebody that's kind of like on the outside looking in what? what would you say those are? Sure. Um, the three, I have three components of the program. So they all work synergistically together and they're all focused on lowering inflammation, um, lowering inflammation through nutrition by filling our bodies with things that fight inflammation naturally and mm -hmm. starting to remove the things or limit the things, lower the things. I don't want to say we're restrictive that cause inflammation. So the first component, the, the, some of the research I got the most excited about was a physician or a researcher, I'm sorry, a PhD named Dr. Mark Mattson. He worked for the National Institutes of Health and he was an expert in Alzheimer's and dementia. Mm. And he discovered the link between fasting and lowering inflammation because he saw that in the fasted animal models he was using that had Alzheimer's and dementia models that they were much more productive and their cogn cognition was much better during the fasted state. So he kind of went down that rabbit hole on a biophysiologic basis, like looked at what receptors are turned on and off when we're fasting and really was one of the first people that made that connection. And he's also a mm -hmm. very good speaker. And so um, he's got TED Talks, you can look him up. So okay. intermittent fasting is the first component of the program. And, mm -hmm. and I chose it first because I think it's the thing that scares people the most because, oh my yeah. God, coffee, my breakfast, how can it, end? you know, mm -hmm. the thing about intermittent fasting is it's flexible. You can pick whatever window works for you, your schedule, your life, you know, you can move your window around depending on what's going on in your life and you're not really going to usurp the benefits. Right. That in and of itself. I've seen a lot of people lose weight from fasting, but it's only really a modest weight loss tool. It's mm -hmm. really a personal tool. It is powerful at lowering fasting glucose, cortisol, and um, insulin levels. Mm -hmm. And all of those three together lower inflammation levels. Now, in that eating window, you can eat a lot of crap. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can right. eat yeah. pro-inflammatory pro foods, pardon my mm -hmm. language. Um, and you can, you can, you can blow your calories out of the window. Um, one of the cool things that we don't do is we don't count calories mm. in the diet. And I love that. <laughs> really hard. That's part of fuel refocusing, like learning to let go of calories, because probably if you're, you've come to Galveston diet, you've ended up somewhere in our world, calorie counting wasn't working for you. If it was, you wouldn't yeah. be with us. Exactly. So, you know, not to say that calories are not important. Of course they are, but we don't focus on them. We focus on nutrition. So mm -hmm. Two of the program is an anti-inflammatory approach to nutrition, learning lots and lots and lots, go doing a deep dive into not only what foods are anti-inflammatory, but what components of the food. We talk about anthocyanins, we talk about phytochemicals, we talk about, you know, things and we, we start changing the mindset around, look at this lettuce, you know, <laughs> like mm -hmm. it has fiber, it has magnesium, it has nutrient, you know, and so you're looking at food as how does it serve me? Yes. as far as my wellness. Um, and mm -hmm. then we, we do a little bit deeper dive into what things we know cause inflammation and it's not gluten. It's, not, you know, we, we touch on those things, but those are very specific medical conditions that have kind of been mm -hmm. in social media. Yeah. We talk about things like nitrites and artificial colors and artificial flavors and things that are done in the processing, ultra processing of foods that mm -hmm. takes that might've been healthy the way God made it, but now has been completely stripped of any nutrition and chemicals mm -hmm. added to, to make it more nutritious. I mean, you know, just learning to, uh, you know, start leaving that stuff on the curb and really focusing yeah. on 
anti-inflammatory foods. And finally, right. the last component is fuel refocus. One, letting go of calories. Two, you know, celebrating food, but learning to not utilize food for our, to numb ourselves, you know, as a mm. product. You know, a mm-hmm. lot of love addiction, you know, sugar is a lot of that for people. You know, we, we focus on following the American Heart Association's recommendations of lowering our added sugars, not fruit. You know, I'm talking about sugars mm-hmm. added processing and cooking. Yeah. Less than 25 grams per day. They're like, oh, can I have honey? Sure, if it fits in your wind, you know, if it's less right. than So, you know, it's learning how to budget things, learning how to rethink your nutrition. So mm-hmm. all of those three things together. Um, and of course we have meal plans. We have all that. I don't love meal plans. Cause I feel like some people tend to just want to look at the meal plans and just mm-hmm. do that without right. going to the educational portion. The most powerful thing about the Galveston diet is I spend hours educating people mm-hmm. through, you know, videos, through reading material, through graphics we've had created. I did all the graphics at first. Of course they were Mary Claire's graphics. Now I have a graphic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can relate to that. <laughs> So, uh, you know, it's so much better. We've had the videos all redone. You know, people yes. who joined us years ago were like, wow, it's a whole new program. I'm like, it yeah. is. It's beautiful. I was in the portal a few weeks ago because I gained 15 pounds during the pandemic. I just was like using food as my crutch. And we, a lot of us were doing that, you know, going to the carbs and the sugars and the high fat stuff and all those things that felt good at the time to kind of get us through that phase. And then, you know, when I came out of it was when I found out I was menopausal had the middle age spread going on. I'm like, I need to go back to the Galveston diet. So I logged into the portal and I was like, wow, it looks amazing in here. And, um, you know, I love what you said about the meal plan because I go to the meal plan sometimes to get ideas, but I feel like once you learn all of the concepts and you are so good at the education and I geek out on research and, and learning the why behind everything, then it makes it easier to make this a lifestyle so that you can go out and buy the ingredients yourself to make the meals, to cook for your family and things that they love. Um, and, and, you know, still be able to do the diet without needing the meal plans, although they're a great place to start. Like they give you that formula that here's your list. This is what you need to buy. Now this is how you put it together and that sort of thing. So I do love that they're in there, but also that you give us, you empower us to be able to do this on our own and to be able to make this a long-term decision. And I still have my treats once in a while, you know, I don't completely restrict, but um, I love that I know how to get back on it. And it's, and it's easy to just jump right back into it for sure. Yeah. So I want to, I want to talk about two myths that I saw in your TikTok. And if you're not following the Galveston Diet on TikTok, you must follow. <laughs> um, she's amazing. <laughs> so the number one myth that I've seen on TikTok is people talking about alcohol being poison. And you should never, ever, ever drink alcohol. And you have a different approach to this. So tell us about that. So um, if, okay, so when they looked at the Mediterranean, so Mediterranean diet is really was just a sociological study done on people who lived around the Mediterranean, someone noticed that people who lived in this geographic area had way less chronic disease. They died from Mm -hmm. old age stuff, then young heart attacks, young strokes, young cancer, young whatever. And all they could find, because it's a pretty um, ethnically diverse group that lives around the Mediterranean, but they eat the same. Mm -hmm. And so when they looked at diet, uh, at their, when I say diet, when they looked at their patterns of eating, they saw several things like fermented cheeses, not a lot of other dairy, um, you know, a lot of fish, a lot of shellfish, uh, a lot of fruits and vegetables, olive oil, you know, um, they, um, and they had women had about one glass of wine and men had no more than two a day. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, a glass of wine with dinner was a normal thing. Mm-hmm. Six, one. <laughs> so alcohol has been found to be medicinal. There are, th- there are, um, in the uh, skin of the grape, there are anthocyanins, which are highly antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Mm-hmm. So a glass of wine a night is actually medicinal. You have better health outcomes. Now, that is not to say if you don't drink alcohol, you can't be healthy. That is not true. Right. If you drink alcohol responsibly from a medicinal standpoint. One glass of wine a night for a woman does not mean you can save up six for the weekend. <laughs> Good point. To be healthy. Now, yeah. Alcohol is like sugar, you know, it can be a crutch for a lot of people. I've mm-hmm. had my own issues with this. Lost my brother last year, my dad, about two months ago, and found myself kind of over drinking to numb some of the emotions with that. Mm-hmm. 
So I had to pull myself back. I'm actually, we're doing a 50 day challenge right now in the Galveston diet. And one of the components is no alcohol. I'm on mm -hmm. day nine, day me. Yay. So, um, and it's also allowing me to unpack some of the emotions and, and grieve without the crutch. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and so it's, it's smart, but you know, you shouldn't, if you feel like alcohol is not serving you, mm -hmm. you may want or taking a break or getting some therapy or some counseling or something, but right. all alcohol is not poison. Mm -hmm. um, wine is probably the healthiest choice. Mm -hmm. um, but when they look medicinally, one ounce of hard alcohol, clear alcohol is better than colored because of the carbs. Mm -hmm. uh, sugar. But um, red wine is a little bit better than white. White is better than the sweet wines, you know, and then hard alcohol, mm -hmm. but only marginally different. So, okay. A drug of choice, you know, but really mm -hmm. one dose is all you get. Otherwise, yes. you have undone all of the good and now you're falling down the inflammatory pathway. For sure. Yeah. I, I have one glass of wine per week. My husband and I have our tradition. He has his red, I have my white. I'm like, ah, I really wish I could get on board with the reds, but uh, maybe someday. I don't know. I know they're slightly healthier. Uh, I, I get yes. nauseated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm not alone in this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. So the other myth we're going to debunk is about hit workouts. Um, I've seen all of this chatter lately about they raise in cortisol and, and they're not good for you. And I've done hit workouts for years and they work really, really well for me personally. I love them. They challenge me um, and I don't want to give them up. So please tell me I don't have to. Nope. So I saw all that too. And I was like, I saw it so many times. I'm like, okay, fine. So I go, when I research, I go to PubMed which is the mm -hmm. public medical database run by the National Institutes of Health. And it is like where you go to find peer reviewed <laughs> information, not the 25 year old Jim bro who's trying to get you to buy his workout. So here's what they found. Um, definitely you can, anybody can overtrain and that's a hard thing to pin down in anyone, but overtraining is more to do with not being properly, you don't have enough nutrients on board, you're overstressing your joints, you're overstressing your tendons, you know, et cetera. Um, when they talk about HIT and raising cortisol, they, any kind of high intensity exercise will raise your cortisol in the short term. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's yeah. our body's response. We, we are purposefully stressing out our bodies just enough so that we become more resilient and our muscles. Mm -hmm. That is the purpose. Yes. That's good stress. Yeah. So stress and however, cortisol levels over the next 24 hours are much lower than if you never did the HIIT exercise. Mm. Multiple studies in women, menopausal women. So I'm like, girls hit the gym. And if you're not doing resistance training, you are losing muscle. We go through mm -hmm. sarcopenia starting in our mid thirties, which is the natural loss of muscle mass with age. To fight it, you need to make sure you're getting enough protein and you're doing consistent resistance training. Mm -hmm. So HIT can be an important part of that. To me, HIT's efficient because I get yeah. my cardio and my resistance in one day and I'm done, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, absolutely. You need to do HIT. I don't know okay. where it came from. There is a temporary rise in cortisol, but it is short-lived because then when you look at the, the overall cortisol- The level, bigger picture, yeah. Sleep are the ones that are important, not the ones after a workout. Okay. So your resting cortisol levels are what you need to pay attention to. And nobody- okay. But yeah. when they did the studies, which are expensive, and you got to have these women in the gym and doing all this stuff to measure it and make sure you're doing this right, there was no bad effects unless they overtrain. Yeah. You need to listen to your body to know if you're overtraining. All right. So last question. It's on supplements. Um, I know that this is a huge hot topic too. Like we're so confused and inundated. And I know at one point in my life, I was on like 22 supplements a day, which was insane. And I just emptied the bucket and started over. So what do you recommend? for women at this stage okay. and, 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 and kind of goes hand in hand with the Galveston diet. Great question. I love this question. Thank you. Thank you for asking because there is so much chatter out there. There's just so much noise. Mm. Here's okay. You should strive any woman to get the bulk, the vast majority of her nutrition through food, through, mm. through whole food, the way nature intended it to be. Yeah. Okay. We were, our species developed based on what came out of the ground or what we could catch. And if you have a intolerance, if you've chosen to become vegan or vegetarian, if you, you know, don't like fish or allergic, you know, 
there are things that create gaps in people's nutrition that are choices or are things that you, you would be ill if you took that most mm -hmm. people don't have. So okay. There are people that need supplementation because they have a natural gap. Mm -hmm. so like, well, how do I know? Track what you eat. Download a tracker. I track mm -hmm. everything. I know I got enough magnesium. I'm usually running low on calcium. So, you know, I supplement. So your supplements should be tailored for you, your needs, your nutrition, your daily. Okay. Needs. okay. So I, for me, for example, I usually get easily 25 grams of fiber in my food choices daily mm -hmm. like for that. Okay. I supplement with fiber to get me up to 35. That is the upper limit of normal for a woman. Okay. Well, I is I had an uncle who died of colon cancer, mm. you know, at 50 mm -hmm. and I have other GI issues. Chronic you know, constipation is an issue, so this helps keep things moving along. Okay. Yeah. So I choose to supplement that. Second thing is vitamin D. So we know that 42 percent of Americans are deficient in vitamin D. Mm -hmm. um, menopausal women, that number can approach 85 percent. So more than wow. like. You're a woman in menopause, you are deficient in vitamin D. Lots of reasons yeah. for that. We absorb less as we age. We're not getting enough in our diets. We're not going out in the sun as much. I'm constantly putting on sunscreen. I'm wearing sun shirts outside, mm -hmm. you know, to keep me from getting wrinkles and skin cancer. That's yeah. coming down on my natural vitamin D. Now people are like, well, I go in the sun. You have to have whole body sun exposure, meaning a bikini for 20 minutes, three times a week to even come close to thinking you might get enough vitamin D from sun. It's not mm -hmm. like you know, you have mm -hmm. to be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I and I don't want wrinkles either. <laughs> doctors are checking vitamin D routinely now because it is involved in over 600 enzymatic processes in the body. Wow. It's so really important. And yeah. vitamin D deficiencies are, are linked to obesity, heart disease, cancer, uh, diabetes. That's an easy one. Okay. 50% mm -hmm. of us are deficient in magnesium. Track what you eat. Mm. Then if you feel like you're, if you find out you're low, that's when you might want to consider. Now, magnesium can also be medicinal, meaning um, my, my daughter takes magnesium because she grinds her teeth. Her doctor recommends mm -hmm. she takes a medicinal dose of the L3 and 8 brand, the Neuromag, that crosses the blood-brain barrier better than any of the other magnesiums, specifically so that it'll relax her jaw. Okay. I take the exact same formulation to help me sleep. You know, mm -hmm. I find more restful. I don't have to rely on melatonin. There's nothing wrong with melatonin, just the mag works better. And I, I certainly don't have to do the um, sleep aids or any of that stuff. Yes, right. So, more um, natural way of doing it for sure. Other people take magnesium for gastrointestinal issues. That's a whole different formulation of magnesium. So that's one you really need to talk to your doctor about. Yes. See which formulation you need based on your symptoms. Okay. Um, also take omega-3 fatty acids. Mm -hmm. I just love them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're mixed. So with many benefits. They're powerful antioxidants. Yes. I do not eat fish enough, um, even though I live in the water. And um, <laughs> salmon is my, you know, if I could eat salmon every day, but it's hard to get it fresh. I'm in Galveston. We have a lot it of is. tubes. You know. So um, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D and fiber and mag are my personal. But, you know, again, it's, that's my life. Those are my kind of gaps. Those are things mm -hmm. I have to So I think there's a place for supplements, but Every day you should strive to get as much as possible through food. Yep. You cannot out right. supplement for nutritional choices. So taking a handful of supplements and going through the drive through you're not doing any good for yourself. Not going to do it. No, no. I love that advice. It's, it's all individualized. And also it's, it's just a great reminder that we should be tracking what's going in our mouths every day. <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, I learned a few new things today. So thank you so much for joining me. And you can learn more about the Galveston diet um, at galvestondiet.com. Is that correct? <laughs> okay, great. And I will link, I will link this up in the caption as well. So you can click on the link and go there to learn more about Dr. Haver and the Galveston diet. Thanks again for joining me. Take care.